Hello, and welcome to the latest of our CSF podcast with a focus on psoriatic arthritis. We'll be bringing you new episodes monthly alongside our Discussion Rheumatology and AXPA podcast, and we'll also be supplying you with monthly slide decks to help keep you up to date with the latest research and publications in the field of PSA. Hi, I'm Philip Mies. I'm a professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine and director of rheumatology research at the Swedish Medical Center uh, in Seattle, USA. And I'm here with Laura Coates, a professor, NH NIHR clinician scientist and senior clinical research fellow at the Oxford Psoriatic Arthritis Center. Welcome, Laura. Thank you very much. Um, so the papers that we're discussing in the podcast today highlight two topics that are deeply relevant to the modern psoriatic arthritis treatment landscape. The first publication sought to compare patient characteristics and the efficacy and safety of advanced thera therapies between female and male patients with psoriatic arthritis participating in RCTs. And the second paper, which we'll then go on to discuss, described malignancies in patients with a variety of different rheumatic conditions treated with upadacitinib or with active comparators in the trials. So firstly, I'll hand back to you, Philip, for paper number one. So our first paper is entitled Sex-Related Differences in Patient Characteristics and Efficacy and Safety of Advanced Therapies in Randomized Clinical Trials in Psoriatic Arthritis, a Systematic Literature Review and Meta-Analysis, of which I was one of the authors, and Leahy Eder, who is a professor at the University of Toronto, was lead author and organizer of the exercise. We know that psoriatic arthritis clinically manifests differently in male and female patients. For example, uh, females may have uh, greater degrees of um, peripheral symptomatology, as well as um, a more uh, severe uh, burden in terms of function, quality of life, and so on. And males uh, may have, for example, more axial disease and uh, may have other uh, differences, more, including more psoriasis than female patients. There are also sex-related differences in disease outcomes uh, that we've been increasingly observing when we've taken the effort to really uh, analyze the studies post hoc and see how differently uh, females and males present at baseline and how they do over the course of a trial in terms of a response to a, a treatment. But there is limited information on sex related differences in these randomized controlled trials. So, this systematic literature review and meta analysis aimed to report the following outcomes in RCTs of advanced therapies, including both biological and targeted syn therapy in PSA, participation by sex, reporting of sex disaggregated data, meaning characterizing whether the female response from the male response on baseline characteristics, as well as efficacy and safety endpoints sex differences in efficacy and safety. So in this systematic review and meta-analysis, investigators searched Medline, Embase, and central databases and conference abstract archives from their inception, that is the use of these various medications, to June 10th, 2022, for RCTs that assessed the efficacy of advanced therapies in PSA. Two reviewers extracted information on participant characteristics and rates of ACR20, ACR50, and minimal disease activity response by sex. Random effects models were used to calculate pooled effects of ACR20, 50, and MDA in male versus female patients by drug class. What were the results? So the publication looked at the results from 54 different trials with 11,514 
or 50.9 percent of 22,621 participants being female and 11,107 or 49.1 percent that were male. So right off the bat, you can see that they were pretty close to each other in frequency in these studies, which reflects the fact that psoriatic arthritis as a, as a disease is pretty much equigender, unlike rheumatoid arthritis, which has a greater predominance of females, or AXPA, which may have, at least in the older, uh, older way of looking at the disease, a greater preponderance of males. We're beginning to understand that uh, the full spectrum of AXPA might be more equigender. Now, sex disaggregated results were reported in a minority of the studies. Nine or 17% of 54 reported baseline characteristics by sex. 18 or 33% reported efficacy by sex. And two, 4% reported safety endpoints by sex. And most of these that did disaggregate the data did so since 2020. And I think that's partly because uh, the companies are now getting it that there might be differences in male and female response. And so they're very interested in going back and doing these, um, these dis dis disaggregated studies. At baseline, male patients had lower baseline tender joint count, health assessment questionnaire scores, pain scores, patient global assessment, and physician global assessment than did female patients. So in general, males reported that they were doing better, especially on these subjective measures. Male patients also had higher baseline psoriasis area and severity index scores, that is an objective measure of skin disease, and C-reactive protein concentrations compared to female patients. If we look at response, ACR20 response by sex varied across drug classes with higher rates in males than females with IL-17 inhibitors, IL-23 inhibitors, IL-12 and 23 inhibitor, uh, that is ustekinumab, and TNF inhibitors. But no difference, interestingly, with JAK uh, and TIC2 inhibitors. So the biologic medications tended to have more in the way of difference with males uh, having a better ACR20 response than females, but pretty much similar uh, with the JAK and TIC2. If we turn to ACR50 response, it was the same thing was observed. It was higher in male patients versus female patients in all drug classes, with the exception of JAK and TIC2 inhibitors. Male patients were more likely to re reach minimal disease activity with all of the drug classes. So whether that be IL-17 inhibitors, IL-23, et cetera, and JAK, as well as JAK and TIC2 inhibitors. So the conclusion from this work was that the biological sex of patients with PSA influence their response to advanced therapies, but the effect varies by drug class. Why might that be? We'll get into that in the discussion. Selective reporting might have influenced these results, so that's, that's a limitation. And future trials should report baseline characteristics and endpoint results by sex. And I can tell you that as I've spoken with various companies as they've been designing their trials, they're, they're actively planning on this type of an analysis uh, even uh, before they start the trial. And we have an example of one particular company, uh, a company called Moonlight Pharma, that has decided uh, to design their phase two trial so that they stratified by male-female uh, status. And so we, they have a, an equal number of patients in each arm of the study. Laura, what are what's some of your thoughts about these findings? Yeah, so I think it's become much more of a hot topic in recent years. And I think obviously historically, and, and as you've shown in the meta-analysis, a lot of studies just didn't have the information. Nobody ever thought to look at whether male or female patients did differently. Um, and so we didn't know. 
Um, and obviously that's become, um, people have become much more aware of that. Um, there's been a lot of research looking at the differences between men and women. And this very much fits with the rest of the data out there. Um, generally that women report higher levels of disease impact, um, more pain, more tender joints. Men usually have slightly worse psoriasis. Um, and certainly for response, I think it depends as well what kind of response you're looking at. So in a lot of the data sets, we've seen that women show a similar kind of percentage response improvement, but they start with more disease activity. And so they end up with more disease activity. So it's harder for them to hit the kind of good outcomes like minimal disease activity or remission um, is much trickier for them to hit um, because they're starting just with higher scores. Um, and I think certainly, hopefully, as we move forward, we'll see more and more active comparator studies and head to head studies and treatment strategy trials, things that really help us as clinicians to select medications. And I think for those, it's really, really important that we think about stratifying for sex, because if we're looking for a smaller difference, any imbalance in the groups could really have a big effect. For sure. So I used to think um, years ago that most of this difference might have been due to a higher degree of, quote, fibromyalgia in the female population than in the male population and differences in pain, pain response, pain sensitization and so forth were primarily um, responsible. But I, uh, over time, I've, I've come to appreciate that there might be a, a Diff significant differences in basic immunobiology between males and females. There's some data that kind of comes out of the University of Toronto that teaches us some uh, some about this. There, of course, uh, there might be neurohormonal uh, effects uh, uh, as well as uh, other basic biological factors that may uh, be influencing this. We also, but and in seeing, by the way, that the TIC2 jack inhibitors are pretty similar. It sort of reinforces that it's not just fibromyalgias because why wouldn't they uh, uh, respond? Uh, be, why wouldn't there be a difference there? Some of this may be due to the fact of the different uh, the biologics tend to be targeting a single cytokine, whereas the uh, jack uh, inhibitors and TIC2 are, are doing more of a a composite of, of various cytokines that, and somehow that, that might end up uh, making uh, it respond more similarly. Uh, fortunately, we have an exercise going on in, within the GRAPA group, currently led also by Leahy Etter, in which uh, called the SAGE study, in which we're enrolling over 400 patients, male and female with PSA, who are changing or starting therapies, and we'll be, uh, this will be a much more in-depth uh, and focused look at this, and we're studying uh, differences in immunobiology and uh, a variety of other factors uh, uh, to understand better this difference. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, there's so much more to understand, isn't there, with this difference in gender? I think it's still a relatively new field, um, even though it's been very trendy in recent years and we've seen a lot of evidence around it. What we haven't got yet are the answers as to why. And I'm sure it's really complicated and multifaceted. I don't think there's one answer, but it's going to be a mixture of lots of different things. And I think increasingly people are realizing that it isn't just that women complain more, that there might actually be some real differences that we need to get to the bottom of. So um, that will be really fascinating in terms of what we can show up with the um, with the future research. OK, so we'll move on to the second paper, and this is called uh, Malignancy in the Upadacitinib Clinical Trials for Rheumatoid Arthritis, Psoriatic Arthritis, Ankylosing Spondylitis, and Non-Radiographic Axial Spondyloarthritis. Um, so it's really across all of the rheumatology conditions um, looking at Upadacitinib. So obviously this has become, again, another kind of topical um, point for discussion around the safety with JAK inhibitors. We know that patients with RA have an increased risk of malignancy related to their severe disease, but the risk of malignancy in PSA and AXBAR is not particularly clear. And when the oral surveillance study looked at cancer risk in patients on tofacitinib, 
it showed a clear need to really understand the safety profile of JAK inhibitors better. There was clearly a risk, and um, the study didn't meet its non-inferiority outcome, but it seemed to be very much in particular subsets of patients. So the idea of this study was to look at malignancies occurring in patients with any of those different rheumatological diseases, so RA, PSA, AS, or uh, non-radiographic XBAR, who'd been treated with either upadacitinib or any active comparators that were in the trials. So this is an integrated safety analysis. It includes data from 11 phase three upadacitinib trials. Um, the, the largest number, six trials in RA, two trials in PSA, um, two trials in AS, and one trial in non-radiographic XBAR. And then they looked at treatment emergent adverse events um, for the RA group, uh, for a pooled group of the higher dose of upadacitinib, um, comparing with adalumab, where that was used as an active comparator, with methotrexate as an active comparator, all in the rheumatoid studies. Uh, and then they looked in the PSA studies, they had data for upadacitinib 15 milligrams, for 30 milligrams, and for adalumab, and in AS just for the uh, 15 milligrams of upadacitinib, and the same, same in non-radiographic XBAR. And then obviously all of these trials are slightly different lengths and people are exposed to different drugs in the studies for different periods of time. So they reported that this as exposure adjusted event rates. So the number of events per 100 patient years on the drug. So across all these different studies, they've got a median treatment duration between one and four years. And the longest is just over six years in some of the rheumatoid studies. So obviously for safety, it's still a little bit on the shorter side. Um, we want, we want long-term data, but obviously we did see a difference um, even in the previous tofacitinib study. And across all the different treatments and the different indications, the rates of malignancy, if you exclude non-melanoma skin cancer, range from 0.2 to 1.1 events per 100 patient years with non-melanoma skin cancer from uh, zero, not seen at all, to 1.4. And then when they looked in the RA studies, the rates of malignancy, again, excluding non-melanoma skin cancer, were generally similar between the upadacitinib 15 milligrams group, the 30 milligrams group, the adalumab and the methotrexate group. And perhaps, perhaps unsurprisingly, breast cancer and lung cancer were the most common. And I think that just reflects the common cancers that we see in patients in this in this age group and obviously in, in a, a, a higher proportion of women in the RA studies. In RA and PSA, they did a Kaplan-Meier analysis to look at survival curves and onset of malignancy um, and didn't see any difference between the two doses of upadacitinib, so the 15 milligrams or the 30 milligrams. But in RA, they did see higher rates of non-melanoma skin cancers with the higher dose of upadacitinib, the 30 milligram compared to 15. And both the 15 and the 30 milligram UPA doses showed higher rates compared to adalumab and methotrexate. So maybe a little bit of a signal in terms of non-melanoma skin cancer in rheumatoid. When they looked in the PSA program, um, the rates of malignancy excluding non-melanoma skin cancer, and then the non-melanoma skin cancer rates were pretty similar between the two different doses of upadacitinib and adalumab. And in the AS and the non-radiographic XBAR studies, they just had very infrequent reports of malignancy. So there wasn't really enough data um, to be able to, to make any conclusions. And there were pretty few events of lymphoma across all of the clinical programs. So generally speaking, the rates of malignancy excluding non-melanoma skin cancer were pretty similar with upadacitinib at both doses, with adalumab and with methotrexate, and they were quite consistent across the different rheumatological diseases, be that RA, PSA or AXBAR. Um, but they did see a possible dose-dependent increased risk of non-melanoma skin cancer in the patients um, treated with upadacitinib in rheumatoid arthritis, which I guess is a bit different to what I would have expected. I would have thought maybe if we were going to see an issue with non-melanoma skin cancer, it would have been in the PSA patients who've maybe had some light therapy and, and are a bit of an increased risk anyway. But I think generally speaking, 
with all the caveats that this is kind of clinical trial data sets, they're not our normal population. It seemed to be reassuring and positive data um, looking at upadacitinib across the conditions. So I wonder, Philip, for you, like how much has this Jack issue kind of come to the fore in your clinic and how much has it impacted on whether you select a, a Jack inhibitor? So it has come uh, out in discussion, obviously, because we are honor bound to talk about oral surveillance. And um, I would say that, especially for younger patients in the PSA and XBA age range, they can't quite relate to it as much as the older rheumatoid uh, arthritis patients who were the target population in oral surveillance, those over the age of 50 and those with a elevated risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So it has some bearing. You know, a patient may say, well, I think I'll wait and, and maybe use this down the road. But, but for the most part, uh, our patients have been uh, um, sort of said, well, we understand and we also understand that the signal was very, very slight or very, very low. Looking at all this that data that you've presented, it's hard for me to know much about causality, except for the data on the dose and non-melanoma skin cancer. That that does raise more, I think, a, um, a signal for ca causality when you see that kind of uh, dose effect. But otherwise, we didn't see a dose effect, nor uh, a difference from adalimumab for that matter. Yeah. And I can remember at various times during clinical post hoc reviews of, of clinical trial data. For example, I, I, I uh, am aware of a patient who had ovarian cancer diagnosed a month into the, a trial. And you know that that's been going on for some time. Yeah. So there's so many factors that you need to take into account. How, when, when was the cancer diagnosed? Um, was it there was there a long latency that was long before the exposure to the uh, drug at hand? So uh, I think uh, this is a great effort to bring to our attention uh, this kind of uh, data on, on malignancy, which is an important subject, but but doesn't give us a lot of answers about true causality. Yeah, I think we need more research going forwards, don't we, and to think about rates that we see in our clinical population. Um, and obviously, particularly now, now moving forwards, we're going to have a bit of bias introduced in any of the real world data because people are going to be more nervous about using these medications in people with a, you know, a higher risk of cancer or of cardiovascular disease. So there's going to be a bit of a selection bias in the way we choose therapies in clinic appropriately, um, but it's going to make the, the comparisons a little bit more tricky to do. Um, but I, I guess it comes down to the right choice for the right individual, doesn't it? You know, where we've used JAK inhibitors more recently in clinic, I can think of patients where we, we really haven't had other good options and it's definitely been the right option for that patient. Um, you know, yeah. patients with, with axial disease and inflammatory bowel disease, we don't have a huge number of options available to us. So it is very useful and some of our AS patients who've been desperately waiting for something that isn't an injection, um, you know, this is a, a really big difference for them to be able to manage their disease with an oral medication that we haven't but, had as an option. I agree completely. And and I really especially appreciate your bringing up the overlap with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So we've had a number of patients that have done extremely well who I have gone on uh, upadacitinib for uh, IBD plus uh, their spondyl arthritis uh, type symptomatology. Well, great. Thank you so much, Laura. And we would like to thank you for joining us for this PSA podcast brought to you by the CSF. We really hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to our channels on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts from, so that you don't miss any future episodes. If you want to read more about what we've discussed today, head over to cytokinesignaling.com, where you'll find detailed summary slides of each of the papers. 
See you next time. Hi, I'm Dr. Philip Neese, clinical professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine and director of rheumatology research at the Swedish Medical Center in Seattle, USA. Head on over to the CSF, where we have just posted the latest PSA podcast discussing sex differences in advanced therapy, as well as upadacitinib-related malignancy risk in patients with PSA. Head over there now to take advantage of this free independent resource. Hello, I'm Professor Laura Coates from the University of Oxford in the UK. Do you want to learn more about sex differences in advanced therapies, as well as upadacitinib-related malignancy risk? Then head on over to the CSF, where we've just uploaded the latest PSA podcast featuring discussions on both of these important topics.